Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is. I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and this is part two of The Proving Ground. <laughs> okay, all right, so here we go. Okay, and so so we're back, all right, and we left off with the Aberdeen Proving Ground, which is, you know, essentially what this area here is, this series of peninsula and islands, all right, and conveniently located <laughs> over my over my god hairs right and so what the Aberdeen Proving Ground is it is the last active US Army testing facility right and there are 11 major commands that have uh, tenants tenant units there and I, and I can't go into all of this right now just because I have too much episode to do but I highly recommend taking a tour <laughs> around Aberdeen Proving Ground right all right but I will touch uh, a little bit on it right and its history, it's, it was established on October 20th, 1917. And, you know, look at the eights that pop from that. The eight and oct and 1917 is two eights, if you want to put it that way. All right. Six months after the U.S. entered World War I. And its location allowed for the design and testing of ordnance material to take place near contemporary industrial and shipping centers. Meaning that if they found something that worked, they could make it real quick and get it out to the battlefield. Right? And that it was the successor of the Sandy Hook Proving Ground. And this is in New Jer northern New Jersey near New York. And it was the Proving Ground, the testing facility that the U.S. Army used post-Civil War up to the Spanish-American War, I think. I'm, I'm not so good with my late 19th century, early 20th century wars. <laughs> but, so, but it was after they closed Sandy Hook that they opened Aberdeen. All right? And... They have this Edgewood Arsenal, right? And Edgewood is the name of the town that's right near there. And this is where they made the poison gases, you know, mustard gas, chloropicerin, phosgene, right? And they started production there in 1918. They don't say when, but by November 1918, they had made over 10,000 tons of toxic gas, you know, which is something like 2 million pounds, which is unbelievable, All right? And... You know, from 1955 to 1975, they conducted classified medical studies at Edgewood, at Edgewood Arsenal. And who knows, this is just what surfaced, you know, or on the surface. Who knows what other programs they had there, because you know that they went very deep with this stuff. But this particular one, they say 7,000 soldiers took place in these experiments involving 250 different chemicals. But that, but long-term follow-up was not planned as part of the DOD studies. So essentially, they just poisoned these people. You know, while they had him on base, that was great, but then just let him go. You know, who knows what happened to them afterwards? They didn't care about that results, right? Unbelievable, right? And some of the agents that were tested here, look at this crazy list of chemicals here. And I think it's interesting that these psychoactive agents, LSD, PSP, cannabinoids, and so forth. And I don't know what this agent BZ was before I saw this, but, you know, it's this, um, it's an odorless military incapacitating agent. <laughs> So it's knockout gas. <laughs> and the Soviet name is Substance 78. <laughs> but I think it's interesting that they were testing these here when we know that the use of psychoactive agents, you know, is tied with the incidence of apophenia. All right. <laughs> All right. And, and, per and pareidolia. All right. They had irritants and riot control agents tested there. You know, interesting stuff going into what's happening today. All right. Alcohol and caffeine. <laughs> the Jaeger bomb <laughs> was born in Aberdeen. <laughs> right. All right. And another interesting aspect to it, as these ties get crazier and crazier, you know, the Gunpowder Meeting House. What the Gunpowder Meeting House was, was this historic Methodist church. I believe the first Methodist church built in Maryland, but don't quote me on that. And now the thing about this to me is, Look how plain and ordinary quaint this building is. This is exactly the type of building that I expect the early, the early colonial settlers to have been making and not the massive grandiose buildings that they, that they built. And they talk about what happened at like Carroll Island in these places. And now Carroll Island, as I said, was a place I looked at. I was like curious as to, you know, what happened here? I mean, it just looks so desiccated and blown out. You know, and they only let you get so close to it, you know, when you pop down and you're just looking at like a green mess, you know. But, um, you know, they talk about they 
massive chemical testing happened happened here. And they also talk about here on where was it? Here on Pools Island, they tested Agent Orange of all things. And I think also it may not be coincidental that this Pools Island is right on top of one of my god hairs. And I'm sure I probably mentioned that in a previous episode, but never made the connection to Pools Island and Aberdeen Proving Ground and Agent Orange and <laughs> and all of that. You know, <laughs> unbelievable. All right, and that this Churchville test area had a, has a test track with hills that provide steep natural grades and tight turns to stress engines, drivetrains, or, you know, tanks, fighting vehicles, Humvees. And so I'm assuming that that's what this area was, right? But it just still drives me nuts that it kind of comes off of this, this eight-pointed star, you know, the star of creation, the bringer of life, you know, the wheel of life, the wheel of the year, you know, the trivial pursuit <laughs> pie tray. <laughs> Right? But still, just the way it comes off in this wave is just amazing. You know, when you do get closer, you can maybe see some that this is graded. You know, I don't know. It's tough to see from this up up above, it's like, two-dimensional image. But, you know, again, really just absolutely crazy looking to me. And, um, you know, so I never really... And so I had heard of the Proving Ground one other time. <laughs> And that was a few years ago, and that was when this happened. This was actually kind of a fun news story at the time. This was in October 28. Good Lord, the eights. <laughs> Look at the eights on this. Eight, two eights, right? and then 2015, you know, so that's six, seven, eight. <laughs> that's unbelievable. But this but this blimp, this missile, m missing military blimp, right, was was found floating somewhere near the ground in central Pennsylvania or whatever, but it had been moored or stationed at Aberdeen. And what this thing does is it's a spy balloon. They send this thing up. You send it to, at a high enough altitude, it is absolutely invisible to the naked eye, not to mention they could use cloud cover to hide it. All right, and so this was a fun story. <laughs> All right, but the amazing thing is, is that, you know, so they talk about how these are tethered balloons, essentially, uh, aerostats, right? And that the cost of one is $175 million. <laughs> Unbelievable, the price tag on that thing, right? They spent $2.7 billion on this project, right? They want to call it a failure. But, you know, we know what applications can be used with, with technology like this. All right? Yeah. <laughs> right? So... So all of this and finding out more about the Aberdeen Proving Ground, I needed to find out more about the name Aberdeen. What is that? You know, does that mean anything? And so Aberdeen is a city in Scotland. And so they say that Aberdeen has seen human settlement for at least 8,000 years, 6,000 BC. The earliest charter was granted by William the Lion, who I believe was related to the, the kings of Jerusalem, the, the European conquering kings of Jerusalem. Right, and it had a charter granted by Robert the Bruce. But the thing about Aberdeen, they really, they don't go too deep into the history, and I'm not going to go that deep into the history, but there's a couple of things about it that are kind of interesting, that kind of tie it into what's going on today, and that was that there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague there in 1647, right? And also that it had a lunatic asylum, you know, a madhouse, right? Kind of tying that in. But one thing I noticed when I was scrolling through was its flag. And it has this flag here. When I first saw it, I was like, Wait a minute. Am I seeing things, or is that the is that the the flag for the U.S. Car the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, All right? And it's not exactly, but man, it's awfully close. You know, I haven't seen the flag in a while. But again, you want to talk about making connections, you know? And so, what is all of this? All of this is, and so this is being amused by apophenia, right? And I found this article in Psychology Today, right? And so it discusses, you know, what apophenia is and how we can use coincidental events to build narratives that are kind of false. And they use an example of things kind of messed up in your house. You know, and is it a burglary? Is it a plot of some sort? You know, and that the article touches on, you know, that we use as, as humans, we use apophenia and things like pareidolia as sort of defense mechanisms and, and, and learning tools that help us recognize patterns in nature that help us survive you know, and help us make decisions on things, right? And, you know, so it's as examples of apophenia are, are, or patternicity. And right, they talk about this Michael Shermer guy, he calls it uh, patternicity, 
All right, so he talks about, you know, seeing Jesus and Mary, like, in toast. <laughs> hey, um, but he, but they say, but here it says conspiracy theories are associated with apophenia, you know, such as the belief that the Twin Towers of 9-11 were destroyed in a controlled demolition perpetrated by the government, and that that's confabulations based on misperceived patterns. <laughs> oh, really? Right? Okay. <laughs> and that such fallacious reasoning also has potentially adverse social consequences. You know, for example, despite a paucity of evidence showing a casual connection, many parents do not vaccinate their children because they believe such vaccinations cause autism. And now, so it's interesting phrasing the way they write these sentences, but so what is paucity of evidence showing a causal connection? You know, so what pa paucity is, is the uh, something in small or insufficient quantities or amounts, scarcity. So what he's saying is there's a scarcity of evidence, but a scarcity of evidence isn't no evidence. And also when you think how much this type of science is pay to play and the prevalence of publication bias in scientific journals, especially among the pharmaceutical companies who are looking to, to either potentially make a profit or somehow in some other way, shape or form control the population with these vaccines, All right? Paucity does not mean no evidence <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. And if that making all of these connections the way I have, you know, are confabulations based on mis misperceived patterns, you know, I don't know. All right, so I think it's time we have a little bit more fun with apophenia in these misperceived patterns, right? And what better place to start with some misperceived patterns than with psychology today? So let's do that, right? And so who publishes psychology today? And when I go down and look, Right, it's uh, Sussex Publishers. <laughs> and so let's take a look at Sussex Publishing and see what we can find. Sussex Publishers, LLC Profile Company. All right, and so what does it say? Sussex Publishing all right, has, um, so it says that Sussex Publishers has 21 total employees and it generates $2.73 million in sales a year. And there are three companies listed. And now the thing about it is I could not find what the other two companies were. Believe me, I looked. I mean, I didn't go do crazy looking, of course, because there's only so much I, I can or am willing to do. All right. But, you know, I looked at their LinkedIn. All right. And our staff of writers, editors, and programmers. <laughs> so I want to click on their website. Oh, I can't reach their website. <laughs> Are you kidding me? All right. So that's what I could find there. All right. Sussex Academic Press. And so for the Sussex, and for the Sussex Academic Press, what is the, what is the book that they publish? Ten Myths About the Jews. <laughs> Here it is. It's unbelievable. All right. And I guess this, I don't know if this Sussex Academic Press is part of the same limited company because I can't find anything really connecting them other than the name Sussex. <laughs> right. Here's their psychology today because, right. And one thing I did find though was that Back in the day, there were comic books published by a Sussex publishing company, all right? And one of them was a comic called Brain. Do we get an issue of Brain here? All right, with this egghead kid. <laughs> How is it that in the 50s they were publishing these comics? And there was another, there was a couple other ones too, but I'll just use this one. It's called The Brain. Sussex Publishing goes on to publish Psychology Today, you know, and so... I wanted to find out more about Sussex, you know, so what's what's the connection with Sussex? What does Sussex have to do with anything? Okay, what Sussex is, is this county in southwestern England, and not only that, it's one of the oldest places, like historically speaking, in the western world, in Europe. <laughs> I mean, some of the earliest Neolithic man is found, remains have been found here, so they, they tell us, right? And it's, uh, and it has one city, which is this uh, Chichester. Right. And when you look at that, look at that right in the middle of the town <laughs> there. Right. But I cannot go into the, the deep history of Sussex the way I would like to. Amazing, amazing history that I'm going to be getting into at some point along in the story. But really, I just want to keep playing with the apophonia here. <laughs> right. And how else we can continue to make connections. So Sussex is, of course, right next to Arundel. Right. And Arundel is, of course, the namesake for our own Anne Arundel. The First Lady Baltimore herself, right? daughter of one Thomas Arundel, 
and someday I'm sure I'll get deeper into the history of the Arundels and their importance and everything. But, you know, so there's not only that connection that can be made directly into Baltimore, right? Also, a rare parchment manuscript of the U.S. Declaration of Independence was found in West Sussex, right? And to make it even crazier, now I'll try to leave a link for this article too, because I can't get too deeply in, but, all right, and someday I'm going to have to do an episode of this all on its own. Right? But now drawing, Su now we have to remember the connection that we're making here, Sussex with psychology, right? <laughs> the Declaration of Independence is definitely a tool of psychological warfare, and no doubt about it. The fact that one is found here in Sussex, because not only is Sussex the namesake for the Sussex Publishing Company, which publishes psycho psychology today, not only was this rare copy of the Declaration of Independence found in West Sussex, but... But the 10th Earl of Shaftesbury lived there as well. Right? And he was from uh, Dorset, which is right near there. And Dorset, I believe, is an area that Miss Havisham has looked at in her videos. Right? And right, so he was the grandson of the 9th Earl because his father, the 10th father, died. His grandfather outlived his father. So that's how he becomes the, the 10th Earl. And that he pursued the same goals of his second great-grandfather, the 7th Earl of Shaftesbury. Yeah, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> So I just want to point out to psychology today <laughs> that I can go into apophonetic shock <laughs> just by making connections off of who your publisher is, tying it back to the history of psychology and the population reset and, and, and maybe even to the aerials and the, the firmament. <laughs> and who knows what else, you know? <laughs> so maybe that's what I should call this episode, <laughs> apophonetic shock. But anyway, all right, so I'm going to wrap this one up here. This one may be the season finale. I don't know. Anyway, if, if that is the case, I hope you guys enjoyed this last run as much as I have. You know, I've enjoyed uh, bringing it all to you. And uh, until the next one, cheers, guys. Okay, so there were a couple of things that I left out of the, of the video for time concerns because I thought the video was running a little long. And there was one very important thing that I left out because it was just really super new to me and it just slipped my mind as I was making the video, uh, which I want to touch on. So I'm just going to tack it on at the end here, and I'll cut the video into two parts or more parts <laughs> as I see fit. But uh, as I was talking about in the mudletting with Miss Havisham video, the 10th Earl of Shaftesbury was murdered. And I don't think it's a coincidence that he died or was killed at the age of 66. Right? But as I mentioned that he picked up his feelings he picked up his great-great-grandfather's philanthropic pursuits, and he was president of the Shaftesbury Society, which was this society based around ragged schools and the re-education program that the 7th Earl was all about. And I'll talk about that when I finish up on the 7th Earl and that story, which eventually I will get to <laughs> someday. But, uh, you know, the thing about Tony here, and that's what I'll call him because it's just... <laughs> Tony was a party animal, right? He liked the nightlife. <laughs> he loved a boogie. <laughs> and he loved younger women. And he liked getting married, too. And so they talk about how in... in no, so they talk about in how in 2002, he meets this Yamila Ben Umberic. Right? And they party it up and they have a good time. And she convinces him that she's pregnant with his baby. And this really ramps up his infatuation with her. And, you know, he marries her, much to the chagrin of her family, you know, because she has a really bad reputation, not only as a Playboy model, right, which is which is a running theme for him in the young women that he likes. His previous girlfriend before Yamila was a penthouse pet. Right? But um, he, he, he starts lavishing her with, like, expensive condos in the south of France and other properties and things like this. You know, but it turns out that she wasn't pregnant at all, right? And after a couple of years, he gets bored with her. And he goes to find another younger girl <laughs> to be his girlfriend. And he go he wants to marry her. So he wants to get a divorce from Yamila here. And so in late 2004, November 2004, you know, he's threatening her with divorce. Right? He arranges to meet her in the south of France. And after spending a few days at his four-star hotel, he checks out on November 5th and is never seen alive again, right? And so what happens was it turns out that he goes to meet his estranged wife here and she has her brother there and a big fight breaks out 
All right, and the brother strangles Tony right? and puts him in his car and throws him over a cliff. All right, and that's it. Never seen again alive. But because he was a party animal, it takes a few days for anyone to sort of realize that he's gone because this is his M.O. He goes away for a few days. He parties it up, you know, and then he comes back. This time he didn't come back. All right, and so the police really have nothing to go on. They got really no leads. There's clearly no body or anything like that. And so the case goes cold for several months. And then in February of 2005, Yamila admits herself into a psychiatric hospital where she has an emotional breakdown and she's confessing to her husband's death. And so the story that she ends up pitching is that, you know, she and her brother are there. Her brother's name is Muhammad. You know, Tony shows up, big fight breaks out, Muhammad strangles him, but it was all an accident, right? You know, Muhammad claims to just gone into a blind rage. He doesn't remember strangling Tony. Yamila says she wasn't even in the room. She was so upset by the fight that broke out that she left. And you know, when she comes back in, Tony's dead, right? And they, and so she helps him move the body into the car where he goes and throws it over the cliff, all right? But the problem is that they've actually been building a case on Yamila for a long time. And they do have a wiretap on her sister's phone where they catch her com uh, confessing to prearranging the meeting, making sure her brother was going to be there and setting the whole thing up, paying off her brother with like 150,000 pounds or something like that, or maybe 100,000 pounds to do this deed. All right, And they also have her cell phone GPS tracked to the location where the body was dumped a few days before the murder. All right, so they got him a hook, line, and sinker. But the problem is both of these embarrics are crazy. <laughs> and, you know, in the end, after they're, they're found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison, all right, uh, Mohammed ends up being so severely crazy that he cannot even... Uh, testify at his sister's appeal and he doesn't he doesn't even appeal at all right and so really you know not so much in the way of like apophenia with this story of his with the story of his murder so much but there is an interesting connection i think that perhaps could be made if you really stretch this apophenia line thinly to where the embarrics were from all right and at least yamila here is i don't know the relationship with her brother whether they're full brother, sister, half brother, whatever. But, you know, Yamila here, I found out because there's really very little to find out about Muhammad, at least superficially, you know, there's only so far I was willing to dig. But Yamila, his mother's Tunisian and her father was Moroccan and she actually grows up in Tunisia. And so Tunisia, oh, here she is. Let me show her real quick. Why not? <laughs> and this is the type of woman that, that, Tony liked, especially in his old age, and I, you know, party animals. She says that he was partying with cocaine and was was really aggressive and angry towards her and stuff like this. You know, <laughs> and I'm thinking, Jesus, you put a big enough line of coke in front of this guy, he dies of a heart attack. You know, <laughs> why not do it that way? <laughs> right? But, but anyway, so as I was saying, so she's Tunisian, right? And right, Tunisia is I don't know what it was in in the past. But, you know, it was, um, you know, that's where Carthage was. And so there are ties to the ancient world and the ancient world narrative that they present to us through Tunisia. And we have the red and the white with the, with the Muslim crescent moon or the, with the Ottoman crescent moon. And we had a, a pentagram in there. And so with the way that, that the Coopers, the Ashley Coopers <laughs> were and their involvement in with the crown and everything else, and how the crown has ties to the Ottoman Empire and so forth, you know, maybe there is a little more to this story than just bitter, jealous, soon-to-be ex-wife upset that her money train is getting cut off. <laughs> right, so there's that story, which I, you know, is kind of incredible. But just interesting story there, right? And the other bit that I looked into playing along with the apophenia was that there was this, you know, Pareidolia article from Earth Sky that I looked at that gave me this. And so I went digging around as to what Earth Sky was. Look, scientists are going on strike on June 10th. <laughs> For what? All right, so now this wasn't here yesterday. 
<laughs> Scientists go on strike June 10th. What? Thousands of researchers around the world have pledged to pause their work on Wednesday to support the ongoing Black Lives Matter. See, now this is getting insane with this. And, and, I, and I'm not prepared to go that deeply with it at all. But, you know, if you're paying attention at all, you know that this that this Black Lives Matter thing is, is completely orchestrated, right? And how is something that started as a grass, allegedly as a grassroots civil rights movement to uh, against police brutality in America become this global thing? You know, there are, I saw that there were riots, there were Black Lives Matter riots in France and stuff. What? <laughs> why, is, why are scientists shutting down their work? What is going on with this thing? is absolutely insane. <laughs> That's unbelievable. And so, when I, and that's not even, those aren't even, that wasn't even the headline that was there yesterday when I was <laughs> working this up. Because what I really wanted to show was that according to their Bloomberg company profile, Earth Sky Communications Incorporated, right, is recreation facilities and entertainment facilities. Recreation entertainment presenting itself once again as science. <laughs> right? That is unbelievable. So you want to talk about your apophenia? You know, is this a misperceived pattern? <laughs> yeah, you know, that it lists itself in, in Bloomberg as recreational and entertainment, yet here it presents itself as science. I don't know. Right? And then the last one, which is really kind of mind blowing, and so this came up because Mary and I were having a conversation over coffee yesterday morning and she said just you know have you ever looked at the list of notable covid deaths uh, not really <laughs> i really hadn't you know she says why don't you pull that up and start scrolling through and look at the occupations of some of these people who are these notable deaths you know and so what the line of the conversation was is that perhaps people could be using covid as a cover to eliminate a certain element or a certain certain people, not everyone, but certain people that may know too much. Right? And so while looking through, you know, seeing some of the early deaths, you know, in Wuhan, of course, right, this director of ethnic and religious affairs commission, you know, he, you know, that could be, he might know some things, right? But this is where it starts to get interesting. This guy, 53 years old, not the target demographic for COVID, which again is significantly older, not that younger people and people of this age group aren't getting it or dying from it but that's not the that's not the norm right but he was a professor of genetics there you know so that's kind of interesting you can make a connection there but this is really nuts this is the whistleblower right he was a doctor of ophthalmology he was 33 years old <laughs> are you kidding me with that <laughs> and i highly recommend reading his story you know it's really amazing but this is really nuts. Whistleblower, dead at 33. And again, reading his story, it's really, really suspicious. There's all kinds of funny business around his death. You know, you should definitely look that up. And going through, you can pick out certain occupations and stuff. Because it's interesting that it jumps, some of these notable deaths jump from China right to Iran. Right? And who some of these Iranian deaths were. But the one I really want to show, because again, the game is just nuts. You can... You can pick out all kinds of occupations and people from here, but there's one in specific that while Mary and I were talking, she had not looked this guy up. And as I was scrolling through, I found this guy. Where is he? This guy, Stefan Lip, Lippy. You know, I wasn't even looking at the names. I was looking at the occupations because I saw this CEO of Swiss RE from 2009 to 2000. I, was, I didn't know what Swiss RE was. All right. And so when I, I what is Swiss RE? Right. It's a reinsurance company. All right, and so I'm not going to get into all what reinsurance is, but it's, you know, it seems like a, a giant scheme, scam, somehow money laundering or something. I don't know. It's really strange, this reinsurance business. Insurance companies take out insurance on themselves kind of things to, to help offset any major overriding that they may have to do or any major claims that they may have to pay. All right. And it has offices in 25 countries. It was founded in 1863. But the amazing thing about it is that Swiss RE was the lead insurer of the World Trade Center. <laughs> right? The lead insurer of the World Trade Center. And so who was Stefan Lippi? And what was he doing for this company in 2001? Well, he joins the, uh, the company in 1983. In 86, he becomes the head of underwriting. 
In 88, he's appointed deputy member of the management board. In 91, overall responsibility for the activities <clears throat> in German-speaking countries, as well as a full member of the management board. 93, appointed chairman of the executive board of the Bavarian branch. 95, appointed to the extended board, ex the extended executive board of Swiss RE as head of the Bavarian group. And in 2001, he became head of the property and casualty business group and was elected to the executive board of Swiss RE. Now, it doesn't say when, but, you know, clearly a major part of this operation for many, many years by 2001 you know, even if he wasn't aware of some of the shenanigans that was going on with the insurance, the insuring of those buildings, what a great scapegoat to bring the new guy in in 2001 or give him this position. He may not know anything, but maybe he knows too much. Maybe because what he died at age 64, you know, not that old. And if he was in good health and everything like that, I don't know. Again, apophenia. <laughs> and all right. And so just wrapping it up real quick, I just want to have this little thought here, you know, with apophenia and pareidolia and everything like that is, you know, I have a lot of fun on my show with these things. You know, I laugh a lot, but, but these things affect people in very different ways. And for some people, apophenia and pareidolia are heavy burdens and they cost relationships and friendships, you know, and cause a lot of stress, paranoia in people's lives, you know, but, you know, I just want if, if, and if you do struggle with this, especially in these times, you know, with the COVID and the race riots and the economic collapses. And I mean, this is a very, very stressful, heavy time to be living in. You know, you're not alone and there's nothing wrong with you for thinking the way that you think. <laughs> right? And if you are feeling overburdened by all of these thoughts, please try to find some time to take some mental health for yourself. Reach out and talk to, to somebody you know, and you can even reach out to me. I have an email address, baltimorefats at yahoo.com. Yeah, I'm happy to listen to your story or talk to you a little bit because I understand how hard all of this is. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up here, I guess, on that note. As I was saying earlier, this may be the season finale, maybe not. I would like to finish up on the 7th Earl of Shaftesbury, but I'm not sure when I'll get to that. So, all right, until the next one. Cheers, guys.